Oh, attention, please. So welcome everybody. I'm here again. If you didn't see, if you didn't see me before, um, my name is Luca. Um, I'm gonna present you. I'm gonna show you like Ignition, which is something that we mentioned already before. Uh, I'm not the main developer uh, of Ignition. I'm just like another guy coming from Corus. Uh, if you want to thank somebody for all of these, the design or whatever, like go to this fine guy here in front. He's, like, he's the main developer in Montana right now. Um, I'm gonna give like it's a lot of content. It's pretty packed as a presentation. Um, don't worry if you miss something, it's gonna be online. Um, <clears throat> so I'm coming from CoreOS. I'm mostly like an engineer, I'm a developer. Um, I used to do like Rust and Go. Um, I was I am in the free software ecosystem like since forever pretty much. Um, I work at Red Hat nowadays, as you know, after the acquisition. Um, I'm Italian. I actually work in Berlin. We still have the Corus office there. If you pass by, say hi. Uh, and before, I was working in security as a researcher. Um, this talk is pretty much like giving an introduction to Ignition and then zooming into the details, starting from like why we did that. So learning from history uh, in order to write something that fits better in for the future. Um, <clears throat> So the first thing, the really first thing is like, uh, what is the context of all of this? Um, the context is um, we ship a distribution um, and we have some problems, we have some tasks to, to tackle. Um, and there are some projects that exist in order to solve these problems, to tackle these tasks. And sometimes they are good, they are like well done and they exactly fit in what you're looking for. And sometimes they're kind of like, everybody's using them, they fit well in the like, larger use case, but for your specific things, they are not exactly what you would like. Um, and our context is, we're coming from shipping a distribution. Actually, we, we are still planning to ship a distribution, let's say, um, so back in the past, um, which is called CoreOS Container Linux. This, is, this distribution is a bit like different than the usual Linux distribution. Um, it is meant for what we would call an immutable infrastructure, which is a place where you can quickly and like easily recycle a uh, machine. So your servers are kettles, you can throw them away and spin up new one. Um, in that environment, uh, you want to kind of like, to kind of like have uh, quick provisioning. Um, the OS itself is something that you don't care about. We ship it for you and you only, pro you only provision it, you apply your configuration to that. Um, to that extent, the OS itself is immutable. It means that like, you cannot control it. Uh, we ship a uh, slash user for you, so a full user partition, which is read-only, you cannot touch it at all. Uh, and this user partition is as minimal as possible. There are no interpreters inside, so don't expect to run your own like, Python program on top of the OS itself. Um, and there is no package manager, so you cannot install other stuff on top of it. But the nice thing is if you, if you put yourself into this context is the, you can quickly do out updates. Like you have two partition, you use an active one, you update the passive one, you reboot into the passive one, something goes wrong, you, go, you roll back to the previous active one. Um, that's our context. Um, next problem is we made a distribution, you boot it somewhere and you want to customize it, you want to provision it. Um, there is a tool to, for, for doing that which is called Cloud Init. Uh, it takes care of handling like the early initialization of cloud instances. Um, and it has like a few, let's say, details, um, implementation or design details. Uh, the first one, it's, it's a collection of Python scripts and modules. Um, it takes some specific input, in this case it's like some YAML user data, uh, and it is like a, a loose collection of services that runs at several points in, in the boot. Um, so in the, in the initial lifetime of a, of a node, but also like during further cycles. Um, there is like an asterisk there because it's like, as everything in engineering, it depends. It may run on the first boot only or it may run also later. Uh, there are a few variables at play here. Um, with these two objects in end, like there are problems. The first one is like, the first set of problems is like it's only relevant with these two elements together. Like uh, first you need Python interpreters and we don't have. Uh, you need Python libraries for cloud in it. We don't plan to ship them. Um, Cloud Init itself wants to control the package manager to install stuff on the OS, but there is no package manager. Um, and many other features that don't fit so well into this use case. Um, and basically this boils down to this distribution, it's minimal, it's read-only, and it's completely based on, on systemd. Um, then there are a few more problems that are kind of like general to the design of Cloud Init. Um, 
from our point of view, of course. <clears throat> the first one is um, it takes YAML as input, uh, which is pretty good as a human interface, but as a machine interface, so when you want to process it in a pipeline, it's not what you would expect. Um, its configuration is a mix of declarative and imperative statements, so you can declare something, and then you can also say, but I want to run these other commands, arbitrary stuff. Um, the setup, the provision itself rates with everything else, so it's just like another service that is booting together with other stuff, and it's running too late. Like, if you want to configure the network, but the network is being set up at the same time, then you have like races, and probably you're gonna run after the network is already set up. Um, and then again, like it's hard to control. Like it can run a multi, it, it can run like in multiple places, multiple times, or it may not. It's quite hard to make a mental model of this. Um, and the, kind of like the, the drawback of this is that it can fail at any point in this process, and you may or may not realize it. Like your node may be left half configured, but the service that you care about, maybe they, are, they started, but some other, they didn't and you don't realize. So it's like, all in all, it's pretty well as a configuration management for a mutable OS. But this is exactly what we are not doing. Um, and that's why we had to do something in order to first ship. Um, and the, the things that we did is we plainly ported it from <coughs> Python to Go. Um, so we wrote something which is called CoreOS Cloud Init, which is basically a subset of Cloud Init. It takes the same um, cloud config, but it's not written in Python. It's just like a Go native library, uh, a Go native application, so it's self-contained. Um, it has like a few, a subset, a minimal subset of the cloud config. So for example, you cannot install packages, of, co of course. And then we also added a bunch of stuff for like what we actually want to do, which is like some sugar for etcd, flannel, docker, whatever. Um, and it was good, like that, that's what we shipped for, for, for a long time. It was what init initially everybody was using to provision um, container Linux. Uh, problem is, there were a lot of caveats. Like you, you had to exactly know the same things that you, that you had to know for cloud in it, which was not great. Um, and at the end, like people were abusing it as like as a gen generic script runner. They were dropping their own logic as like imperative logic inside. Um, and that was like the context where we were starting when we started shipping something. On top of that, we actually had a few wish lists. So it's like, those are real problem, but on top of that, there are some things that if we had to start again, we would do in a different way in order to get some nice um, results here and there. So the first one, of course, is like declarative configuration. We want to have like some documents that say in a declarative way how the machine should be provisioned. Um, these documents should be machine friendly. That is, it should be easy to plug it in a pipeline where it is produced somewhere, it is consumed somewhere else, and in the middle there could be like other automated steps. Um, it should be an atomic provisioning, so it should be either provisioning in a successful way or the node should not proceed into booting some services. Um, and the last step is this provisioning step is something that happens before the node is actually running and the services are actually running. It's uh, a precondition for that, so it should not interfere with the rest of the boot, and at the same time it should not be dependent on how the rest of the services are, are booted and are ordered. Um, and this is kind of like the whole setup of this discussion. Um, so what we did is like, we started shipping something, we took note of all the problems and details, and then we went back to the whiteboard and started like drawing stuff and thinking about things. Um, the first one, of course, is like, well, we don't want to write C, we need something that is um, compiled to native, and at that time we were sticking to Go pretty much everywhere, which is a good choice. Simple to learn, compiles to native um, binary. The next one is, well, let's look at the boot of, of the boot process per se. Um, there are a few steps when you boot a machine. Um, right now we're focusing like on the last part only. Like there are systemd services and we can set up stuff in there and <coughs> it's running together with everything else. But actually before that there are a few steps. Uh, there is one which is like very low level which is whatever your host, firmware, your machine is actually booting, so like BIOS, UFI, some kind of like net booting, some other like more arcane um, hypervisor things. Then there is a further step which is kind of like still related to the one before, which is you need a bootloader, and the bootloader is somehow dependent on the architecture and the way that you're booting it. Um, so in most cases it's grab, but there are a few cases where it's like pixie booting, ISO booting, some other things. 
Um, and then there is like one step in the middle which people are usually forgetting, which is like there is an intram FS. So there is an early use space which looks exactly like a, a Linux uh, user space, but is not the final Linux user space. And the idea was like, let's try to put something in here um, so that we can actually do the provisioning before booting into the real system. Um, the initram FS is nice because compared to, I don't know, Grub, the bootloader, or UFI stuff, it's still a Linux system. It's a minimal Linux environment. Uh, it's, it can still run systemd, so you still have like multiple services and proper like supervision of them. Um, but at the same time, like it's not the full system. So it doesn't depend on like having all the details in the storage or the network or all the other application services being run and you don't care about them. And at the same time, you can initialize them here. So you can provision, you can configure them. Here. Um, which means that more or less putting these ideas all together, we are now drawing on our whiteboard something that looks like this. Um, let's focus on this intermediate step where we have an early use space. Let's make it like as similar as the final user space as possible. So let's use systemd and um, service units everywhere. And let's stick a component in here instead of cloud init in here um, so that provisioning happens here and if it's successful, then we continue booting. And if not, this is a real barrier, so the node doesn't boot. The last idea is, well, we need a machine interface, possibly something where we have like a schema to define it. Um, and that is um, JSON, the JSON schema. Um, there are <laughs> the discussion about like um, uh, data interchange, interchange format is like endless. You can pick whatever you want. Um, I was not there at the time when, when we picked JSON, but my point of view is uh, it's easy to consume and to produce from pretty much like any language that, can that you can imagine. It is actually machine friendly. There are a few, a few gotchas that you learn after a bit, but it's like in general, it's way more straightforward than, than trying to process like YAML in a programmatic way. Um, it, but it's still human readable, so it's like it's not binary, it's not something really opaque. Um, and on top of that, like, it's nice because you have schema, but it's not in band. You can like, provide to producer and consumer um, an out-of-band schema, and you can auto-generate stuff based on that. And those are pretty much like all the components that we put together when we were rethinking how to do it. Um, and that's the idea. That's, that's the whole idea of Ignition. It's not complex. There is nothing magic in it. It's pretty much like put this together and then implement it. And that's and now it's like we are just zooming into the implementation. Like the, the most interesting part was so far, like what we covered already. From here on, it's pretty much just like implementation details. Um, a general overview is what we what we just saw. So it's it's a first boot only OS configuration tool. It, it doesn't run on subsequent boot. Um, the user data is fully declarative, so you don't take it's not like a, a runner for some script per se. You just like take JSON file, J sorry, JSON document with some specific content and it renders it into the, into the file system. Um, it runs in the initramfs, in which means that if you want to repartition your root disk or if you want to reformat your root file system, you can because you're running in the initramfs, so it's still like live from memory. And then you can boot into the real, the real, uh, the real root file system. It takes type JSON as input, which is like important because if you want to process it automatically, you want a definition somewhere. Um, and then there are a few like nice things that is, given that it's still like a full provisioning system, it can actually like reach out to some other services. Like if you are on a cloud, on a cloud provider, you can reach to, I don't know, your bucket system with authentication and, and stuff. And that's the URL if you want to check it yourself. That's a very high level. Um, overview. Um, a smaller, like a low, low, lower level overview is that Ignition is actually comprised of several stages. Um, the, the first one is not Ignition itself, it's external, there is something, which is a system degenerator plus some bootloader logic, um, which is actually able to detect whether it is the first boot or not. And by default, if it doesn't detect that it is the first boot, then it doesn't run Ignition. Um, then there is kind of like a common part, which is not a stage per se, which is like fetching this configuration. I will show you later how to fetch the, this configuration and where it is stored. Uh, but after this configuration gets somehow into your node, into the initramfs, it goes through uh, three stages in order right now. Um, a disk stage, which is let's 
partition and format all the, all the file system that you need. Um, if you want to reuse some file system, some disk, you can just like declare them and make sure that they actually match um, whatever you had pre-provisioned and what the configuration expect. Um, then there is a file stage, which is, let's write some comment, some, some content, sorry, uh, into this file system. Um, and then there is a quench stage, which is this like magic atomic provisioning, which basically means uh, if at this point this service didn't fail, then the provisioning was successful. If the service failed, then we don't continue booting. We stop here and we go into an emergency mode in the fast shell. Um, which means that if you, if you get to here, you are very good. You are not just booted and it's bootstrapping a cluster or doing whatever you're asking for. Um, that's like, you know, <laughs> probably in a clearer way, uh, if you remove this mouse cursor in the middle, um, this description like stages and stuff. Um, and this, this is what I just like described you um, by words. And this is actually like, those are systemd service unit and, that, and those are the real common for that. Um, one step back, we mentioned before, you need to get this input, this user data from somewhere, and that's the part, um, this is something that we were mentioning in a talk before, like um, the images, the instances themselves, they know they can introspect on which cloud provider, on which platform they are running, so they can, pro Ignition can provide like specific um, fetch, configuration fetchers, platform provider for those. Um, right now, Ignition supports the usual suspects, like all the Azure, uh, AWS, Google Cloud, DigitalOcean, blah, blah, blah. Um, it also supports like some bare metal or bare metal-like environments, like usual uh, pixie booting or uh, trivial FTP. Um, there are, in some cases, there are like back channel to the hypervisor, like Kirimo, for example, exposes some back channel where from the, from the gas um, machine you can ask the OS machine to provide you some data, and this data is the, is the user data. Um, and then at the end of the day, like you, when you are provisioning your node, you can specify whether to use the, whatever is the platform specific fetcher or something different. Like I can be on AWS, but I want to fetch some remote, like my own HTTP endpoint, and you can pretty much like mix and match. Um, we are almost getting to the end. Um, Last thing is um, we are taking JSON here. Uh, we are taking JSON here because, again, it's a machine interface. You don't have to write it by hand, um, but you can auto-generate stuff. That's actually what Ignition does internally. Internally, we write the JSON schema, and then we auto-generate the code for that for Ignition. Um, this schema is, sorry, the, the schema that we defined so far is pretty much like whatever we as operator would expect from a provisioning system, which means that uh, you can provide a single configuration, but then this single configuration can reference other stuff, like it can reference another document to replace it, or it can reference like further snips, snip set in order to chain them all together if you want to have some kind of like templating system, um, which is useful for like, dynamic generation, so a node can ask like dynamically what will be my user data whenever I boot. You don't know it in advance, but there is like a dynamic service providing it. Um, and it's useful for like stubbing, like there is a stub here, go fetch it from some other S3 bucket or whatever. Um, and it is some version, which means that like we don't break it, when we break it we change the major some version stuff and we try to kind of like fast forward old configuration to new configuration without breaking compatibility. That's the thing, like, we support out updates, so you can start from like an older version and we try to bring it forward. Of course, like, when there is a major com compatibility break, then like, something is not supported, we may not be able to do that. Um, again, go check if there are a few examples, and I show some in the presentation before. Um, final slide, I think, um, yes. Final slide is, uh, again, I'm stressing this, don't write this JSON configuration by hand. This is meant to be a machine interface. And that means that we, as distribution developer, we have to provide you some tools. But you, as like a community, you can write your own tools. And this is exactly what happens. Like, we have a tool which is like very basic. Again, we are like, uh, we are startups. We don't have like people allocated to project. We cobble things together whenever we need them. Uh, the first example is this CT. It's a configuration transpiler from YAML to JSON. It just adds a bit more logic into the final JSON. But you as a user, you write YAML. Um, then other people wrote provider for us. Like there is a Terraform provider. If you are into Terraform in general, you just define your TF uh, configuration and then Terraform compiles it down to JSON. Um, there are more advanced stuff. Like you can 
dynamically generate these and plug it together into a Pixie environment. So that's what Matchbox does. Um, so that the Pixie environment is, a bit, is, a, is able to provide dynamic configuration to the OS whenever they, ask, they are asking for it. Um, and then the last example is something that is currently being worked on, which is you can install a full cluster this way, which is kind of like the final conclusion of all of this. Um, you can bootstrap a cluster and you don't have to care about single machine configuration, provisioning and installing single packages in these machines because the provisioning is done in, ato in an atomic way in, 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 in ITRAMFS and when the machine boots, it only takes care of bringing up all the higher level cluster orchestrator and not like configuring the machine itself. You don't have to SSH into that. Uh, which means that you can basically like uh, start from scratch and bootstrap a full cluster in a declarative way. Um, and that's it. Um, the only things that I wanted to mention is like, uh, thanks to an ex of our, of our uh, Dalton, which made some of the graphics for that and it's kind of like an inspiration for both the software and this presentation and everything else. Uh, that's it from my side. Questions, please. Could you please describe more how the transition works from this system set? So the question is like, how do I out update the system safely? Um, so the, the answer to that is completely unrelated to this talk, which is you, as the infrastructure owner, you have two approaches. One is like your infrastructure is immutable, which means that it never changes. And whenever you want to change your configuration, you do this like quick recycling of a new node and throwing away the, the old node so that you know that like one node, one node is booting with a configuration and for the whole lifetime, you will always have the same configuration. That's one strategy. Yeah, but it's like, that's possible in some cases, in some other cases it's not. There are other strategies which is like, you provision the node in this way, so you have all the niceties in here. And then you have another component, which is typically part of the cluster orchestration itself, which takes care of like further, further <coughs> mutation of this configuration of the node. Um, that's okay, like you have something that owns changes for the rest of the lifetime of it, and it's out of scope for how you first provision this node. But then you, have a, you may have a problem at that point, which is like, if you're not careful in what's going on, you may have a skew between new nodes coming, coming up with a definition configuration and old nodes being updated in some other way. That's, that's what like the OpenShift v4 um, is, trying to, is trying to do, which is like uh, using the same ignition configuration for both the initial provisioning and having something else, an operator in Kubernetes which takes care of like updating the configuration whenever something changes. Um, but in general, like, it depends where you're coming from. Where this is coming from, we're more on the side of like, my infrastructure is immutable and I can recycle things. And um, where typical like RHEL or Fedora <laughs> distribution are, everything is mutable and you can mutate it at any point. But then it's like, it, it's harder to guarantee that everything is aligned. And I, I agree, I, I see that, I see that problem. And they are kind of like different, different talks. And the problem of Cloudin is that it was merging the two together. That was like configuration management and first boot provision. Um, so, context, not anymore. Um, okay. I, this, the, fir the first three slides were kind of like historical context okay. and those were like container Linux stuff. So container Linux does it. But that's not available anymore. Container Linux is still available, yeah, but it's, it's not, not something that we're pushing for them. It's, so. it's, not, in, it's not, not the scope anymore. In, in anything Fedora, no. This is kind of like a generic upstream project. You can plug it wherever you want, but in Fedora world, no. Um, so, it is internally, uh, sorry, the question is like, um, which kind of storage um, technology do we support and how do you provision that? Um, it is internally shelling out to a few utilities like SGDs, kind of KFS and whatever. Um, and the thing is, it can learn new stuff, like it can do, it can already do RAID. Uh, in the future, it will probably, it may be able to do LVM things. Um, the problem is, uh, those utilities, those things must be in, in the initramfs, and the initramfs must be able to, on subsequent boot, to do the same kind of logic. So like unlocking and putting everything together, which is kind of like 
um, simpler in Fedora world. It was way harder in container Linux world where the initramfs was immutable. So we had to decide before, beforehand what was going to be inside the initramfs. Um, this is something that we are actively like brainstorming how to do more things. We already support something. If you go into the, the schema documentation, it says what. But for example, like it doesn't support uh, encrypting the rootfs because encrypting the rootfs it's easy. It's easy to unlock it when you are creating it. But then you must have a full um, chain of things that are able to unlock it later. And we are speaking about fully automated operations, so not like asking the user for a password for a disk. That's that's, that's clearly like simpler, but it's not it's not in this code. Other question? One here. Uh, you keep talking about uh, uh, BOF being immutable, that ignition runs only once uh, and not two times. Um, what happens when when there is a hardware change, or we need to add something external? For example. We have, we have a bare metal configuration and uh, the NIC dies and mm. we replace it with a new one and we have to recreate or we have, we have a new one uh, with, the, with, the, with the one that we have. So we have to reconfigure the, the network and we don't want to kill <coughs> the, I see. The, 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 the node. So the question is like, how does this kind of provisioning uh, react to changes in the external environment that are either hardware or software, in your case, hardware? Um, and, the and the answer is again like these two strategies. You can say these changes don't happen. Like if a node does some problem for some whatever reason, we just reprovision it from scratch with the new configuration, um, which is kind of like, again, it depends how much control you have on these. And the other answer is like, well, there are things that are always changing on the outside and you have to introspect anyway. It's the case, for example, of like cloud metadata. We cannot know them in advance. And then in that case, it's um, something else, part of the OS must be able to handle this kind of like mutability at runtime. Um, that's an example for like the core OS metadata. Um, it's something very simple and, and, and stupid, but it's exactly that. Like there are things that are changing later uh, and you cannot predict them when you're provisioning a node first. Uh, and they may change later. That's by design. Um, and in that case, like um, something else must take care of this muta mutable stuff. And there is no way that you can do it like from immutable provision, at least from my point of view. That's a non answer, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because uh, it's, it's uh, very difficult to sometimes just to be provision a bare metal node. I know, so but in general. If, but if something happens on the hardware side, then we are stuck. Mm. Uh, on, bare, on, bare metal, on bare metal, it's explicitly like hard or bad because you are not in these like my servers are cattles. Like your servers are real hardware and you have a limited amount of them. Yes, that's, that's especially a bad case. Um, I know. Well, there was one last question. Yeah, what about advanced network support, networking support where people are like VLANs and uh, uh, a network disk like FCOE, uh, something similar? Uh, yeah, so the question is like what about more advanced network configuration that you have to support. Um, there are two parts in this question. One is network configuration in final OS and network configuration in the initramfs. So it's like network configuration in final OS, it's easier, let's say, because we have this initramfs, we configure whatever. That also means like producing a configuration for your network manager, which may not be network manager, but your network manager. Um, and then when the system boots, it's basically like the full boot since the beginning already knows about the network configuration. And that's the easy part, let's say. The hardest part is how do we configure the network in the initramfs? So if you have something like special, like I have three interfaces and only one of them has a gateway, like an coded one, and I have to use that in order to get the ignition configuration. And that is the tricky case. And the tricky case right now is handled by gluing together a few things, including like kernel parameters and other stuff. Um, but that is, again, like it's especially hard in bare metal, um, but it's trivially silly in cloud environment because cloud environment, they don't have this problem. Like you know that you have the ACP, you know that you have the first interface, you know that you can reach the metadata endpoint over that. That covers like 90% of the case. And then there are the additional one, which is like bare metal custom static configuration. And those are like painful, yes. Um, there are ways to do it. And we, my answer usually is your infrastructure should be an API as well. 
So you shouldn't have a static configuration for that. You should be able to spin a node and the node should be asking something else how to get this configuration. And then in that case, it works a bit better because you can auto discover that configuration, apply it in, in ITRAMFS and proceed. I guess it's the last one. No, that's all. Take it out. Thank you very much.